Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to the uh, Suleiman Ravid show. Of late, we've been tackling uh, what some people would say are hot topics. Uh, I don't know how hot or how cold they are, but uh, interesting and important topics is what I would prefer to call them. So we, we continue after a while on the theme of marriage and uh, the different aspects of marriage that uh, require a bit of unpacking, that require a bit of elaboration, that require a bit of demystifying, as they say. You know, when you're driving on the road, there's nothing wrong with the road, there's nothing wrong with the car, but when there's too much of mist, uh, things become uh, complicated when they're not really complicated because of the mist. And if you can demystify things, then everything is clear and you can see right, the road is nice and clear in front of me. There's nothing wrong with the car, nothing wrong with the road and I can progress smoothly. Now, what we're talking about today, the title of the program is Battle of the Sexes in Marriage. Uh, you've got uh, Adam and Eve. We're not doing Adam and Steve discussions here. We're doing husband and wife, right? So you've got a husband, you've got a wife. You've got a male, you've got a female. Men and women are different. Men are from Mars and women are from Venus. What is it that the book says? I haven't read that book to be honest, but I've read about that book. Now we all know, whether you're Muslim or not Muslim, that there's differences in the temperament between a male and female. There's differences in the anatomy uh, and in the physical makeup of both male and female. And uh, therefore, there is going to be certain differences that will play out within the paradigm and within the dynamic of marriage. But more than that is uh, the aspect of what are the roles and responsibilities, this whole aspect of equality. Constantly nowadays you hear people talk about gender equality, gender equity, gender parity, um, and in specific relation to marriage, that what is the role of the husband, what is the role of the wife, and how are they equal, and when it comes to uh, decision making, when it comes to roles, not so much rights, you know, rights is at its place, but when it comes to who plays which role and who takes which decision and how things flow within a marriage, there's a lot of debate within modern society in as far as, as, as the gender aspect of that is concerned within the marriage the paradigm. Now, one is the debate that is out there and one is what is the Islamic perspective. Then you've also got cultural baggage, some of which is good, you know, not everything about culture is bad. When we talk about the so-called Lal Kitab, not everything there is off, you know. Some of the things there are quite good, even though it comes from the Lal Kitab, but it's quite good. It's in sync with the broader principles and injunctions of the Sharia. So not everything about culture is bad, you know. What, what, what is not from Sharia does not have that status. So we would say this is a cultural thing, but it's not necessarily bad. I mean, you're watching this program on a Friday evening or you're watching the repeat on a Sunday morning. So Friday afternoons, if you're Indian, you're having dal and rice, so you're having dalgos. And, and Sundays you're having biryani. Now, nowhere in the Quran will you find about biryani, nor in any of the hadith will you find about dalgos. Uh, Durban has its own variety, dal and sinkers. Joburg has its different variety, dal and rice. And there's a difference. You know, you go and have the dal, uh, dal in Durban and you may get a running tummy from Joburg because it doesn't gel. But it's a, it's, a, it's a cultural thing that is not in conflict with anything of the Sharia. In Ramadan, you have savouries. Where does it say? that the Prophet ﷺ broke his fast with, uh, after having consuming the dates and the, and the water, that they were savories. That's a cultural thing uh, that's, that's uh, you know, related to certain cultures. Other cultures may be breaking with other food stuff. Uh, food is just one example. There are many other examples. So culture is not necessarily bad. However, we felt it was about time that we had a discussion. And I want to put up uh, an important point up front before I introduce our guest for this evening. And that is, let's not get silly and let's not get uh, finicky unnecessarily. There are men watching the program, there are women watching the program. There are so-called people who are conservative in their thinking, and there are those who may be a bit more liberal in their thinking. Whatever you may be, don't listen with the intention of trying to knock the other side or trying to find fault. For once, let's watch a program and let's listen to a discussion with the intention of saying, okay, what makes sense to me? Whatever doesn't make sense to you, no problem, leave it. But what makes sense to me, and let me see how I can use that to improve my marriage or to help others to improve their marriages. You know, it's about time that we, we, we have discussions without fear of being lambasted. Uh, not every time you say something, you're going to be right. And not every time you say something, are you going to secure agreement from everyone. But that doesn't now mean we must conduct ourselves in such a way that on certain topics, people become absolutely fearful of saying anything. And you just want to walk on eggshells around the topic and you want to tiptoe around the topic. And this aspect of gender equality or the battle of the sexes within marriage, you know, the different dynamics between a husband and wife, between a male and female, 
in my opinion, is one of those discussions where people are very scared to speak out. Because you say something, the men will knock you. You say something else, the women will knock you. You say something, both knock you. And then, uh, you know, you're really in trouble. But we have to talk. Because the, the, we, if we don't talk, we don't understand what the issues are, where the questions are, where the ambiguities lie. And, and we'll never be able to understand how different people uh, relate to it differently and understand it differently. Even if you um, disagree with somebody's understanding of the matter, with somebody's opinion of the matter, at least you'll have a better understanding of why they think the way they think. And that is necessary for us to progress in life. So, battle of the sexes in marriage. We have... Two Yusufs in the studio with us once again. These are the same two Yusufs from a previous program. If you watched it well and good. If you didn't watch it, go and look it up on uh, the YouTube channel. Uh, we have Molana Yusuf Ravit and Molana Yusuf Osman. Both Molana Yusufs. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. Feels good to be back. Feeling more comfortable? Uh, not entirely. <laughs> You're looking more comfortable. I think it must be the chair. All right, so I've said... Um, a lot of things, right, in terms of, uh, of uh, my introductory points. <coughs> Maulana Yusuf Osman, if I can start with you. Let's, let's look at a foundational point, you know, a basic point. Are men and women the same in the manner in which they have been created? I spoke about that book where they say men are from Mars and women are from Venus or the other way around. Uh, but uh, from an Islamic perspective, what, what does Islam tell us? Look, uh, it's obvious that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, created men and women differently. He has made uh, their physical makeup different from each other. And uh, this obviously is due to the wisdom of Allah and Allah knows why he has done it. We are no one to actually question why Allah would have done so, why Allah has done so. But apart from the physical makeup being different, if you look at uh, mentally, emotionally as well, men and women also are very different. And this comes from a lot of research. Um, there's research showing you that uh, when it comes to thinking and when it comes to assessing situations, men and women think differently in that as well. Men tend to become more like problem solvers and uh, women when it comes to solving situations, they would maybe be better at uh, recalling incidences or maybe they would be uh, better at recalling a paragraph that they had read or some words that they have memorized. What you had said. What you had said, yeah. And okay. <laughs> quite, quite possibly when you even said it and how, what you were wearing when you said it and whatever it may be. But uh, what I came across was something really interesting where um, there was a uh, psychologist that explained men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti. Now what does this mean? If you look at a waffle, it has different boxes. So men live their life in this way, whereby they compartmentalize everything. And what this actually means is that when the man is at work, he's at work. He's doing his work, he's focused, he has a certain objective, and that's what he is looking to fulfill at the end of the day. When he comes home, he's at home. When he is out fishing with the friends, he's out fishing with the friends. When he's gone for salah, he's gone for salah. So he tackles every situation like a box. He, every part of his life is like a box where he adds that situation inside, sees if he can deal with it. And a lot of the times, if he uh, finds it a very uh, uh, useless or futile activity, then he would leave it and he'd just go on to the next box. So he deals with life one box at a time. And when we say that women are like spaghetti, if you look at the plate of pasta, and you take the one noodle and you follow it, you follow it, you'll see it meets up with another noodle. Then you may even get, the, uh, 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 you may even intersect with another one. You may uh, just swap onto another noodle. So that's exactly how women deal with situations. For example, uh, the husband will come home from work and he'll ask the wife, okay, how was your day today? So she'll say that, no, I was listening to Sabahul Muslim and you know, <laughs> Sulaiman Ravad, he was speaking about uh, how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was treating his wife and you know when you come to think of it also I was just thinking the other day the neighbor was also telling me that someone in their family was getting married and then you all of a sudden uh, asking yourself the question okay what does Mulana Suleiman Ravat have to do with the marriage next door and then all of a sudden you have your child's rehearsal or your child's chalsa coming up so uh, when it comes to tackling situations we'll admire the woman at the way she's thinking but at the same time we also then becoming a bit frustrated that I can't listen to too many because I'm thinking in boxes. So in that way, the, 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 the mental thinking uh, makeup of, uh, of men and women also differs uh, apart from the physical makeup, obviously. Yeah, I like this, uh, this comparison, you know, waffles and, and, and uh, spaghetti because spaghetti, you pick up one strand and then the whole blob comes up. Yeah. <laughs> you intend the one strand. Uh, but but uh, on a lighter, serious note, 
Both the waffle and the spaghetti is made by the woman. <laughs> I think we'll tackle that a bit later on, eh? <laughs> now, yeah, Moana Yusuf Rabat, uh, what it boils down to if you look at the, the debate these days, mm. okay, so are any one of the two superior or inferior from an Islamic perspective? You've got men, you've got, you've got women. Uh, Moisa Osman has explained that they are, they are different, not only physically, but emotionally and, and otherwise. And not only is that the Islamic perspective, but also uh, modern research, etc. backs that up. Now, what, 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 what would we say? Are any one of the two more superior? Islamically, definitely we'll say no. Uh, unfortunately, we do have the dilemma and we have the common debate of gender equality. So in doing some research about this, I actually uh, came to understand uh, actually why there is an issue. So what had happened was previously when people put thought to it and put their minds to it, they actually wanted to equate men and women, uh, using men as a standard. So they would say like, why is a woman inferior? Because she doesn't have certain privileges or certain opportunities that the man will have. So a woman is primarily in a house. She doesn't get the opportunity to educate herself. She doesn't get the opportunity to leave the house, to work and those sort of things. But one scholar put it so beautifully, he said that looking at them individually is the way that Allah dignified them. Allah dignifies you based on distinctiveness, not on sameness. So what does this mean? That Allah has created a man unique and great based on the way he created man. And he has created women unique based on the way he created them. Whoever said that you have to equate or compare men and women? Where did that come about? Uh, that was something to, to, to ultimately draw a lot of the equation, that, as we would say nowadays. But, and, and hence, because if you will look at your relation then, you won't look at your relation between man and woman, you will look at the relation between man and his creator, and woman and her creator. Hence, you will find the distinctiveness and not the sameness. So the comparison doesn't have to be there in the first place. Uh, and in both sides, you know, generally it's, it's, it's viewed from the woman's side as she's the inferior one. I mean, even in our own religion, a man can say that, you know what, the Prophet Sallallahu asked, who is more superior, the mother or the father? Three times he said the mother. So the father can come to the front and say that, you know what, what did I do wrong? Why does the mother have the privilege of having been honored three times before I was honored? But that doesn't mean because why should you compare yourself to the mother? Allah has made you great in other aspects. And Allah has made her great in this aspect. You can't come to the front and complain that Allah hasn't given me the privilege of giving birth, giving birth to a child. Or going through the pregnancy, the honor that Allah has given a mother in that aspect. So on both sides of the coin, if you want to co equate and if you want to compare, you are going to end up in the same dilemma and the same situation. So ultimately, the best way to look at it is you distinct it. You, you don't look at comparing each other. Rather, you look at each other being unique in your own way. All right, interesting stuff. And we want to unpack that point a bit further. But uh, it's time for a break. When we come back, we continue, inshallah. <laughs> Welcome back. So we're talking about battle of the sexes in marriage. It's, it's a very touchy topic in many ways, but it's an important one and one we need to understand. And even if we understand it, better our understanding so that we function within the marital dynamic in a much better way. Now, both Molana Yusuf's, uh, you spoke before the break about uh, whether men and women are created equal and, and whether one is superior to the other or not. And I think you've, you've very eloquently touched on that. But there's a few remaining aspects before we go further into the discussion. You know, once I read somewhere, and I think the person had encapsulated it very beautifully, he said, in Islam, we believe men and women are created equal, but not identical. Mm -hmm. Men and women are created equal, but not identical. The relationship between a man and a woman is complementary, not competitive. So the whole idea sometimes behind gender equality is actually turns into gender absurdity, mm -hmm. that you judge a woman by how much she can become like a man. So you're making it a competition between a man and a woman. So if a man wants a jeans and a top, you must wear a jeans and a top for you to be deemed to be liberated. Mm -hmm. If a man goes with an overall under a car and he's, uh, I don't know, taking out a gearbox, then you have to do that to be able to consider yourself liberated. The greatest insult to a woman is to judge her by the standards of a man. Because like you said before the break, that appreciate your uniqueness. It's, it's about your uniqueness that makes you great, not uh, trying to be the same as, as, as the opposite gender. And Allah in his wisdom has shown us from the apparent also that men and women don't look the same, they don't act the same, they don't talk the same, they don't do the things in the same way. And therefore it's, it's imperative that we understand that you can be equal, but you don't have to be identical. Your relationship is about the two hands fitting in one another, not the two hands uh, competing with each other. Yes, and uh, you know, just to touch on that point, the fact that the woman would want to compare herself to a man, outwardly or inwardly what she's saying is that I feel he's greater than me. 
Because you would compare yourself to someone that is greater than you in order to be like that person. So you have already admitted to the mm. fact that I feel men are greater, hence I want to be like them. Whereas Allah and Deen has never said it. Allah has said that uniquely you are already, uh, you are already great in your own right. And uh, this is something that we have to c come to understand because as long as we're going to be looking at it at that, in that way and in that light, that you know, I have to compare myself, I have to be like him. We're never going to end. It's, it, uh, it's going to just, you won't, you won't have an end road, you won't, you won't be able to come to uh, a sense of contentment because you'll always be at loggerheads, because you'll always be trying to be like him when you can't be, you haven't been designed. Uh, we have to understand Allah has created us, like Mawana said, that uh, He's created us differently. Uh, within our anatomy, within our intrinsic qualities. So if you are created differently, uh, differently obviously your purpose and your, and your role has to be different. It can't be the same. I love how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that note actually uh, unpacks the incident of the wife of Imran, uh, Hanna, when uh, <coughs> she was pregnant with uh, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, Maryam. Then she made a promise to Allah that, Oh Allah, this child that I'm going to give birth to, in the hope of it being a son, a boy, I'm going to devote this child to your services. And when you look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with such wisdom had then given her a female, mm. had given her a female. So she asked for the male, but Allah gave her the female to show you one thing. And at that point, she also realized and she said that I've, I've, I've received this female. The man is not like the woman. However, there's a common role to be played here, and that is the service of Allah. So even this female, I will send in the path of Allah, in the service of Allah as well. So Allah, in His infinite wisdom, had given her that female to show that you may have wanted the male, but that female can also be a servant of mine, can also be dedicated to my obedience and my worship. Indeed, perhaps in a different way, but that does not necessarily mean in a lesser way. You know, there's that famous hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and people get a bit hot under the collar because they feel a. Hey, this doesn't gel with what is the modern standard, where the Prophet says that a woman is like a, like a rib, mm. and that uh, if, you, if you bend the rib, you will break the rib. And, and, and the hadith talks about uh, the crookedness of the rib. And, and people now, some Muslims will try and say, no, no, weak hadith, fabricated hadith, because that becomes the easiest way of not dealing with the issue, because the assumption is that there's a criticism of a woman there by the usage of the word crookedness. Mm. But scholars have so beautifully explained it and said, no, the beauty of a rib is in its crookedness. Crookedness is not necessarily a criticism in the context of a rib, because if a rib were to be straight, it would not fulfill its function of protecting the lungs. So the Prophet ﷺ is saying that like you have a rib that edges and that it bends, or call it crooked, whatever you want to call it on the side, you, it's meant to be that way. You try and straighten it, you're going to break it because it's not meant to be straight. So a woman is more fragile in her emotions. A woman is more sensitive. So treat her sensitivities with sensitivity. Appreciate the fact that she will cry more often, appreciate the fact that her emotions work differently, spaghetti style, so you will want to pick up one thing here and you'll end up something else lifting up. Don't try and straighten that out because you're going against the nature of a woman. And Islam is so pragmatic, so beautiful in its pragmatism, in its realism, that Allah has created you differently, appreciate the beauty in that difference. Don't try and change and say, well, I'm going to treat you like a man because I want to make you feel equal to a man, but you're actually then trying to straighten a rib, whereas the function of a rib is meant to be a particular way. Yes, and I love that you touch on that point because many a time as men, we try to put down a lady or woman using the very same hadith. So if, if she has a, f a flow within her or she has something that's, uh, defi in def uh, she has a deficiency, then we use that, say, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that you were born from a crooked rub. That's incorrect. Because in that hadith, the Nabi of Allah is actually trying to show us that she has been created in that way and that, that way is actually unique and it's remarkable. So it's not to, to look down upon her, but it's to understand her in a better way. But the unfortunate thing nowadays is that we are forgetting the way we have been created as men and women. Uh, what our natural uh, intrinsic qualities, our characteristics, our, our anatomy, the way we have been created because of this whole debate of trying to uh, uh, attain gender equality. So what, in, what happened in the process is now we have actually forgotten how we ought to be and what our actual role in life in terms of our gender and more so especially in terms of a marriage because now when you have the clash between a husband and a wife, two opposite genders, and you have the two of them now confused because they've been brought up in a different way but yet the demands of the marriage demand them to have certain responsibilities and now they have this clash because one is saying no this is not my responsibility the other one says no I, i've been brought up this, this is supposed to be your responsibility so th this is actually something that we need to actually speak about today yes you know i remember my Yunus patel rahmatullah used to say that uh, he found it very ironic that if a woman decides to stay at home and cook for her children and pick up uh, the papers and the dirt left over by her children 
then society looks at her and says, well, that's a backward woman, that's an oppressed woman, that's a suppressed woman. But the same woman, if she goes and wears a miniskirt and walks up and down a narrow aisle, bumping into this one's seat and saying, chicken, beef, chicken, beef, tea, coffee, tea, coffee, rubbish, 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 meaning an air hostess walking right. within the narrow aisle of a plane, that's a liberated woman because she decided to go and do what another woman is doing for the people that she loves, this woman is doing for somebody that she doesn't love and they don't love her and don't care about her. But this woman is liberated and that woman is suppressed. A real confusion, a real confusion. And something that really ties in with that there is how, and, and I, I like how the, the topic has been named battle of the sexes. Mm. But when you think of it also, why is there a need or why does it have to be a battle? Right. If exactly. it was supposed to be a battle, then when going back to Adam and Eve, the first thing that they would have done was go to war with each other. But what was the first thing they had, they, they had done? When they were sent down to earth, they had become intimate and they had become more loving. And that is how procreation happened. That is how the rest of mankind was born and the rest of mankind came about. So it was about love. It was about respect. Why is there a need for there to be a battle? Yeah, absolutely correct. There shouldn't be a battle. And, and, and uh, Islam, we believe as Muslims, is a religion of balance. So if you follow the teachings properly, then everything will fit in nicely. But the, the problem is when we are not, when we don't have a full understanding of our own deen, and then we fall short in terms of how we implement the teachings or how we understand our roles, and that creates an imbalance. But maybe that, that brings us to this point that when we have men trying to be like women and women trying to be like men, what would be some of the underlying factors? Why, why would, uh, what could be the possibilities of this change in mindset? I would say the first point that we already highlighted, that, that generally we would find within the, the, the female sex and the woman, uh, there, there is an inferiority complex that has been created uh, within the Western, the Western world and the Western thinking, making them feel that they are inferior to us. That's one aspect. The other aspect is many a time we as men make them feel inferior. Uh, so example, if we say a woman's responsibility is to look after the children and to tend to the, the, the housekeeping, when we come back from work, the typical example is like you just sit at home the whole day and I'm working. Mm. So automatically what you're telling her is that what you are doing is insignificant compared to what I am doing. Where Dean did not say that. And, and, and besides Dean, in a practical way, if you, and I know I have a child, right? So if I'm, I'm busy with the baby, if I can help my wife 10 minutes, 15 minutes, after 15 minutes I say, not go to your mother. Because it's so, that, within my anatomy and the way I've been built and created by Allah, it's only that much that I can handle. But she has been created in a manner that she can set up the whole night breastfeeding. Uh, tending to the child every time the child cries. So obviously, so you have this within the ma marriage often, more than often, where there's a lot of, there's a lack of appreciation. And then automatically a woman now tries to prove herself that, you know what, if, uh, if he feels that, you know, what he's doing is something great, then what am I doing in the marriage? I suppose upbringing also plays a part, lack of appreciation towards the responsibilities of each other. When it comes to the uh, upbringing, I think that's uh, one, one very important point that will come about is uh, maybe something that maybe we'll even speak about a little bit later in the show. But uh, the kind of perception that's created for the children in the household, so you have the, the man coming home, making certain demands, or if the food isn't cooked in the way that he, he, he likes. Uh, and that's also a lesson for us. When the Nabi of Allah ate a meal, if he liked it, he ate it. If he didn't like it, he didn't make any remark. He just left it out. Mm -hmm. But we'll come home and, you know, the salt is less. This is wrong. There's something wrong with this here. So, the children grow up with that mentality that, okay, you know what, what mommy is doing now isn't, doesn't look like it's such a good thing. Mm. And uh, even that day when she's trying it, she's not coming right with it. So maybe she mustn't even be at home. Maybe she mustn't even do that. And when a child is also looking at this scenario, if it's a daughter, she's probably thinking to herself that when I grow up, I don't want my husband to tell me that day. Mm. I don't want to be the one on the receiving end of remarks like that. And if it's a son, he's going to be thinking that, you know what, I need to have that sort of an authority when I wal uh, waltz in after uh, a day of work and I should have the same attitude. So definitely upbringing, uh, we, we need to consider that our children are watching us. Our children are listening to us and they're picking up on what we say and do. Yeah, you know, they say children learn with their eyes. So you right. can teach them to, to send them to madrasa, they learn one thing, but then they come in and they see the husband acting like a dictator in the house mm. and actually treating the wife as if she's substandard or as if as if uh, she's in, 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 in a way inferior to her. And that boy will probably go on and, and, and treat his wife in the same way because he'll feel, well, that's how it's supposed to be. Yeah, you know, to add on to that, in terms of the upbringing, uh, many a time because of the way we've been brought up in our homes and the way the environment has changed. Uh, so I'll give you a typical example. A girl, for the first 20 years of her life, she doesn't see the kitchen. Right, she goes to school, perhaps she starts in university. Now the first proposal comes, perhaps she did lucky, she, they got engaged. 
Now the mother takes her into the kitchen and she tells her, now you have to learn how to cook. So her entire life, and I, I think this is something common, if we ask our parents at what age, our mothers, did you start cooking? It was quite uh, relatively at a much younger age compared to nowadays. And I feel that is also one cause in using this example, that because of the environment, so now we take a girl, and we, um, by no means am I against education, right? But we're not coupling the two. So we put in them in the school, we put in them in the university, and the day they have to get married, they say, no, my daughter, you have to cook for your husband. It's not going to happen because she will do it, but she might do it feeling it's a burden, feeling it's something that's uh, against her wish. Uh, it won't be something that she'll value, something that she'll cherish because of the manner that she was brought up. Or perhaps on the other side, maybe she had two parents that were working, they were both in the working field. So when she came home, her mother wasn't there to cook for her. She was being tended and taken care of by the, by the domestic. So in that, in, that, in that right, she has been brought up with the knowledge that, you know what, I don't have to do this. So tomorrow she marries a man and the husband tells her, you know what, you have to be at home to take care of the house uh, the housekeeping and you know the taking care of the children she says well that's not the way i've been brought up and then this now ultimately will lead to a confusion and at times also a demand so she now tell her husband that if it's not my responsibility then we have to share so if cooking is not my responsibility we have to share the kitchen if the bringing up the children is not my responsibility we have to share it and on the other side the husband will say well if income is not my responsibility we have to share that as well all right interesting stuff uh, a lot to unpack uh, we continue inshallah after the break All right, welcome back. Now, we're talking about battle of the sexes within marriage. And I think one of our guests, Maurice of Osman, mentioned very aptly up front that it should not be a battle. And of course, in an ideal state, it should not be a battle. Everything should work in tandem. Everything should work harmoniously. That is uh, how Islam has created uh, everything in balance. But we are imbalanced. And because of our imbalance, we kind of inject our imbalance into the, into the marriage and into the society. But we need to then broaden and deepen our understanding of what the balance is so that we can come closer to a state of equilibrium uh, in terms of those, those two genders within a marriage and the roles that they play. Now, so far in the program, we've spent quite a bit of time of trying to unpack this whole issue of gender equality. And I thought it was important because of the narrative that has developed in so-called modern society and, and, and reconciling that with where Islam stands. Now, we, we've covered that to some extent. Obviously, not, not adequate, but uh, it requires a lot of time. Now, we're going to go into some of the, uh, the specifics. Now, many times people will say, okay, whatever you said, all is well and good. We understand that, you know, husband has his place, wife has his place. They've been created differently, but uh, they are equal, although not identical. The relationship is supposed to be complementary and not competitive. All of that on its place, but who's the boss at the end of the day? Who's the boss? Who makes the decision? And I, I would generally say that, you know what, the problem is with that very usage of the word, who's the boss? Mm. Uh, not everything is about being a boss, not only in terms of the dynamic of marriage, even leadership in general, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say famous hadith, Sayyid al-Qawmi khadimuhum. The leader is the one who does the most in terms of rendering service to others. So once you start assuming that I'm the boss or he's the boss or she's the boss, then already you are hiding to nothing because each one of you is wanting to dictate to the next. And I don't think that, in my understanding, is actually the, the, the spirit or the intent of the Sharia. There's no doubt, and, and we are unapologetic about this, that the Quran says, Ar-rijalu qawwamun ala nisa Allah, who is our maker, has determined that men will be the guardians over women. And Allah gives some reason, بِمَا فَضَّلَ اللَّهُ بَعْضَهُمْ عَلَىٰ بَعْضٍ وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Because Allah has given man certain things which allows for him, makes him better suited to be the guardian in the marital and the home dynamic. And also because he carries greater burden and responsibility. That leadership role of a man in a marriage He's made the leader because he's expected to tolerate more, he's expected to do more, and he's expected to exert himself more. That's why he's the leader. Not that he's expected to dictate more, demand more, and that he must sit like uh, the proverbial king on the throne if everyone is fanning him on the sides and massaging his feet at the bottom. And I think that's where the one problem comes in. The other problem is we, we, get, we, get tie, we tie ourselves in knots because we try, and, and we try and adjust Islam to fit it with the modern narrative, and we don't have to. Uh, what is the modern narrative? The modern narrative is that no gender equality. Why? Because men and a woman must not be prejudiced. Mm -hmm. You don't have to buy into that particular model to prove that Islam's model is not one of prejudice. It's one of balance. Because if, if we were to say that uh, the president is not equal to the vice president, mm -hmm. everybody accepts that. Is it a prejudice against the vice president? Not at all. 
The vice president is equal as a citizen of the country. He's equal as a human. He's equal as a politician. But in terms of a particular system that's in place, the president has a rank over the vice president. The vice president has a rank over a minister. The minister has a rank over an MEC. So similarly, they, they, they cannot be two people fulfilling a particular role in a system. That's why you don't have multiple gods. So Allah says, in terms of the ultimate decision making, it lies with the husband. However, the husband has to consult, the husband has to tolerate, the husband has to accommodate, the husband needs to understand all the different dynamics. And I think the key thing here, we always tell people, if you want to understand this whole aspect of leadership within the marriage, don't look at one verse. Don't only look at nisa, but look at the other verse that says, women have similar rights to that of men. You want your wife to beautify herself for you, beautify yourself for her. A man have one rank, yes, that gives them that added responsibility, not that added power of, 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 of dictatorship. And uh, when you have a particular responsibility, you have to see that, okay, what's now uh, expected of me? And Allah says, وَعَشِرُهُنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Treat them with kindness. So whilst men have that position, it's about greater tolerance, greater compassion, greater exertion from your part, not being a greater boss. Now having said that, what about the roles and responsibilities within marriage. Now, we've, we've unpacked to some extent the, you know, men and women have created equal. Who's the boss? I think to some extent we've tried to answer that. What, what is a man expected to do from a Sharia perspective? What is a woman expected to do in terms of primary responsibilities? Using the very same ayah that you put forward, that رجال قوامون على النساء بما فضل الله بعضهم على بعض. Allah then gives the reasons why uh, could we leave the reasons, that's a separate discussion. The, the primary function of a man, bima uh, anfaqo bin amwalim, that uh, his primary function as a husband, among others, is, is for him to bring income to the table, for him to sustain his family, for him to bring uh, that source of income for his family. That's one of his primary functions. Uh, a typical scenario was presented to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hazrat Fatima radiallahu anha with her husband, Hazrat Ali radiallahu anha, came to the Nabi of Allah asking, O Nabi of Allah, the French she ate for us, what are our responsibilities? So he put it for them in a beautiful way, and this is the easiest way for us to understand. That understand of Fatima and Ali, whatever is inside the four walls of the house, is Fatima's responsibility. Whatever is outside of the four walls of the house is Ali's responsibility. Right? So whatever it, whatever it needs to be done within the house, it's yours. Whatever he has to be done out of the house, it's his responsibility. So obviously, income generally, although nowadays we have uh, internet and we have uh, other mediums of, of sourcing income, but primarily the, 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 the system and the norm to earn, to earn the sustenance and to earn a wage is to go out of your house and to work for a living. So that will be primarily the job of the husband. Uh, and then with that, now you have whatever's inside the house, the caretaking of the house, caretaking of the children, and that would fall under the category and the responsibility of a wife. Other proofs that you can also uh, take from in terms of our religion, that when they are together, when, in, uh, when you're trying to identify the responsibilities, see when Sharia says that when they are separated in talaq, in talaq, whose responsibility for, which responsibility falls on which spouse? Allah did not tell the wife that when you separate from your husband, you have to provide income for him. Mm. Allah said he has to provide nafaqa for you, even though you know more his wife for a certain period of time. With that, in terms of inheritance, Allah said that a man will get two shares compared to a woman will get one. Why? Because it's the primary role and objective of a, of a man to look after a, a female, whether it's his mother, his sister, his wife, or his daughter, whoever. So Sharia has, has protected her. So not only has Sharia said it's not your responsibility, Sharia has also said that we've given you the privilege that we've made someone responsible to protect you. And at the same time, when we look at the terbi and the, 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 the taking care of the child, in custody, a boy will be with his mother till the age of seven, and the girl till she becomes balik. So that shows you that the primary and the initial years of the upbringing of the child is the responsibility of the mother. Otherwise, Sharia would have said that you have to be with your father. Only after a certain age, then does Sharia say, okay, now you go into the custody of your father and you'll be under his guardianship and under his care. And to add to that one mm. also, another proof that you can use is uh, the beautiful incident of uh, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. When he was traveling with his wife, then he comes across a dark place and uh, in the distance he finds some fire, he finds some light. Uh, emitting from that place. So he tells his wife that, you know what, you remain here, let me go ahead, I'll go, maybe I will find some firewood, maybe I'll find something, I'll find some sort of uh, familiarity at that place, but let me go out and see what it's all about right. there. And just the fact that Musa alayhi salam said, let me go and look for the firewood, it's somewhat indicative mm. that it was his responsibility to go out and look for something to bring back, bring back some good news. Mm. And the good news that we look at today is, alhamdulillah, a check at the end of the month. 
Alhamdulillah, some food, some groceries to bring back home, some groceries to bring uh, uh, back to the family. And another, another proof that you can even use is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it is the duty of the wife وَالْوَالِدَاتُ يُرْضِعْنَ أَوْلَادَهُنَّ حَوْلَيْنِ كَامِلَيْنِ لِمَنْ أَرَادَ أَيُّ تِمَّ الرَّضَاعَ For a full two years, she should be uh, suckling that child. وَعَلَى الْمَوْلُودِ لَهُ وَعَلَى الْمَوْلُودِ لَهُ The, the fact that, 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 that لَهُ is referring back to the husband, what is it? رِزْقُهُنَّ وَكِسْوَتُهُنَّ That sustenance and the clothing of the child is, uh, the, is the man's responsibility. So Allah has already outlined the responsibilities of man and the roles of man. The question comes about now, how can you balance the scales? Mm. So we're talking of gender equality and we're using this word equality a lot. It's about time we now equal our lives in this way. That Allah has given that responsibility to men. How can a woman now balance the scale? If she's going to go out and, and look at it as her responsibility to also go out and work, you have two people doing the same thing. Then what's going to happen to the household? So that is why, that is how you can then determine the role from Sharia of, uh, of men and women together. Yeah, I think you people have given wonderful examples and maybe just to, to, to tie it up and, and to kind of uh, wrap up this, this particular point is that the primary responsibility of providing, you know, as they say in Urdu, roti kapra makan, <laughs> right? Uh, the food, the clothing and the, the shelter is that of the husband. So even if a, if a woman is a millionaire, maybe her, husband, her, her father was, was a very affluent person and, and she inherited or somebody gave her a lot of money, she's not obliged to spend anything on, on the family. No, is she even obliged to spend on herself in terms of the necessities. That obligation is that of the husband. But in marriage, from an Islamic perspective, we'll always say it's not about technicalities. Because then the husband can say, well, I can buy you two sets of clothing, wear one and wash the other one. But no husband stops there. And it's not uh, beyond, that, uh, beyond those core uh, needs. The husband provides much more. He'll provide the best car and the best house and the best clothing and the best food and holidays and umrah trips and everything. So... There may be certain things which are not technically the responsibility of a woman, you know, to provide, uh, to cook the food or to make lavish functions when his family comes or when his friends come. But because the husband does so much, the wife also does so much. It's about, you know, my love motivates to do for you more than what is just technically obligatory upon me, right? However, when it comes to the aspect of a woman uh, earning, it, there's different dimensions that you can look at it. Sometimes a man, maybe due to financial circumstances, is unable or incapable of providing. So the wife comes in to assist him and say, okay, you, you're earning five grand a month and there's no other job that you can get. So in order to make ends meet, I have to assist you. That, 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 that's need. So the circumstances differ. But then there's also a different dynamic where a woman doesn't necessarily have to go out of the confines of the home. Maybe she's teaching and she earns a little bit, but her primary objective there is not the money. It's, it's the imparting of knowledge. Maybe she's an alima or it's to do something as a service for the community. So on the, as long as we understand whose primary responsibility it is, the wife can supplement it. Similarly, when there are primary responsibilities with regards to the children in terms of the, 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 the chores related to the children, the husband must also supplement it. He must also see how he can, he can assist to make life easy. So when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, came after a hard day's work at the office, so to speak, he helped a little bit with the dishes. He helped a little bit with the affairs of the home and the chores of the home. Yes, and I think that's not only something that we should take note of, but that's something that we have to actually put into practice. Because that's what's going to complete our marriage. And marriage is, as we said at the beginning, is there to complete each other and not to compete with each other. Uh, and the responsibilities are just there as a guideline. It's just there for you so that we don't end up in a confusion. We don't end up in a situation where you, you're struggling to define your role. That's why it's been outlined there for us. But ultimately, then most definitely, both spouses require assistance. Even though, uh, say even if a husband is earning a lot, a wife can assist him by making dua for him. It's an, it's an assistance. So even though she might not have to help him financially, but she can help him in, in securing his job in terms of a dua. But uh, at the same time, majority of the time, we, we are to blame as men that when we go home, we don't want to help. We don't want to assist because we feel that we've done enough. Uh, and we don't realize the, the, the difficulties that the woman might go through throughout the day, even though she's not leaving her home. Uh, so in that aspect, yes, we have to. We have to assist them. We have to make it easy. But the problem comes in now is when you, you struggle to define your role. And because of that, now you start making demands. And that demand is now which majority of the time actually ends up in breaking the marriage, or either breaking uh, the, the spirit of a person or his, his natural intrinsic uh, makeup in the way that he's been built. Because now you will find a man tending to do more things that a woman ought to be doing, or, the, or vice versa. The, uh, like someone told me the other day, he said, I have a problem, a cousin of mine, uh, he's demanding that his wife, because she is working, although it's not the ideal, but because she is working, she must provide 5,000 in income towards the family budget, because she 
is earning an income. So if he had to understand that his responsibility was to provide the source of income, then he cannot demand mm. from her. It, it's yeah, I think, I think it's a key point that uh, there's so many different examples that we can give. Like the wife can say, a woman can ask, whose responsibility is it to change the nappies? Uh, <laughs> the man can say, but whose responsibility is it to pay for the holiday then? Because right. a holiday is not deemed as a, as a necessity. necessity. Right. You can go your whole life without a holiday and, and you won't die. And, and you know, there won't be a, a kind of irreversible impact. And there's, 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 there's a whole lot of different examples, like who stays up with the baby at night? Uh, you know, who does the dishes after a huge function? Once you become technical, that's where it becomes a problem. But once yeah. it's motivated by love, to, to a large extent, it, can, it yeah. can overcome many of the challenges. But you are right in saying that we still need to know what are the technicalities. Yeah. So a man cannot impose on his wife to provide an income when it comes to the necessities. Yeah. However, if a woman says, no, I want to go every year for an international holiday, then the man can say, but you know what, make some samosas and budgets at home. And you would have to allocate so much of money a month to the budget in order for us to facilitate for this particular thing, which is a luxury and not a necessity. And then right. he wouldn't be in any way contravening what is his responsibility because he's fulfilling his responsibility and beyond. Understood. And now if there's something a little bit more than that, then obviously it's required. So if a man wants many, many children, and the wife will say, okay, no, alhamdulillah, but you're going to help her a little bit with the changing of the diapers and you're going to also sit with the bottle a little bit at night because like you tired, I'm also tired. And the wife... It's your primary responsibility. I need a bit of assistance here. As long as we know where the primary responsibility is and where the assistant role is, and the level of assistance will be proportionate to the situation mm -hmm. and the need of the time. The problem, I think, when, uh, when people want to, as, we, as we've already mentioned, that the problem comes about when the roles are being switched. Mm. So a very beautiful example is given uh, by a famous scholar that uh, if you look at Surat Yusuf and the dream of Yusuf alayhi salam, whereby he sees the, the sun, the moon and the 11 stars prostrating before him. And uh, yes, there are many different tafsirs, but the more famous and maybe the more, uh, definitely the more accepted tafsir is that the sun was portrayed to be the father, the moon portrayed to be the mother and the 11 stars to be the children or the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam. And uh, the way he unpacks this dream is so beautiful because he says that, okay, let's look at the sun. What is the, the role of the sun? The, the sun is there to give light during the day. The sun is there, you, you naturally feel a bit more secure, a bit more safe uh, when the sun is out. Maybe not too much in our country, but uh, you, you do naturally feel a sense of security during the day and maybe not so much at night. So like that, the father is there to give that sense of security when he walks into the house. But at the same time, the sun, you, you, you are unable to, to, to gaze directly at the sun because the sun has that awe. So likewise, the children cannot... Uh, uh, just go to the father and make whatever demands he or she wants because there is that awe that the father, uh, the father needs to uh, carry. Mm -hmm. The son is there to, to assist with uh, the growing of vegetation. And that also is another subtle indication that it is the responsibility of the father to make that provision for, uh, for the home. The moon. When you look at the moon, the comfort of the moon, the serenity that the moon gives, that uh, the, 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 a person always loves to look at the moon. You always hear of how beautiful the full moon is. And around the full moon or around whenever the moon is around, you'll find the stars are around. So naturally a child may be a little bit more inclined to his mother uh, if he's going through any kind of, uh, of problem, if she's going through any kind of issue in life, then the mother is generally the first person that they would run to because of that natural sense of comfort that the mother mm -hmm. gives off. Now, when you look at the sun and moon, and when the sun and moon decide to switch roles, what do you have? You have the eclipse. And at the time of eclipse, we know the medical dangers of then looking at the sun or the moon at that time is really harmful. Likewise, when father and mother decide to switch roles, you have what is called a social eclipse. And if you notice at the time of eclipse, there are no stars around. That is why when mother and father decide to switch roles, you'll notice that that is how we are losing a ne the next generation. That is how we are losing our children. He put it very beautifully. Beautiful analogy. Time for a break. When we come back, we wrap up. Welcome back. So today we were talking about battle of the sexes within marriage. We spoke quite a bit about uh, the principal issues, you know, the, the concepts. Uh, we ran out of time in terms of you know, elaborating a little bit more on some of the practical examples, perhaps at another time. But if you understand that the root issue is uh, better, then that helps you to understand the different examples that will manifest itself in, in different situations. You know, the more I think about it, the more I am reminded of a soccer team. A striker has a role, a midfielder has a role, uh, a defender has a role, and a goalkeeper has a role. It all depends on the situation. Right? When you're, when, when, when you're two nil ahead and you're defending, then even the strikers come back. Mm. 
But when you tunnel down and there's 10 minutes left on the, on the clock, that even the goalie will come up to the halfway mark and say, my primary responsibility is to look after the, 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 the goalposts. But the situation yeah, now, these guys need assistance because we need a goal, otherwise we're going to be knocked out of the, of the World Cup. So when, when the opposing team is taking a corner, then even your, your biggest striker will come back and help to defend. But when it's time to, to, you know, to charge, then everybody goes. So men and women have their primary responsibilities, which are different because Allah has created you differently. As a servant of Allah, you're equal. A man reads two rakats namaz, a woman reads two rakats namaz, same reward. A woman is more pious, a man is less pious, she'll get more rewards, she'll be higher in Jannah. In that aspect, you're equal. But in terms of a system, man has greater responsibility. And he has certain functions which are more suited to his makeup, physically and emotionally. She has other functions. But in the end, it's not about being technical. This is yours, this is mine. It's about working together as per the needs and requirements. Yes, and I think I'll conclude on the fact that we have to understand that this system has been created by Allah. So definitely it is a unique system. It's a system that has no deficiency. It's there to work. So once you understand your role, your responsibility, it's just a guideline. You have to put the extra effort. You have to make it happen for your marriage. And uh, it's, uh, ultimately, that's what's going to be to make the success of your marriage, is that how much you're going to complete each other instead of competing with each other. And my closing statement is simple. If you look at the word woman, it has a man inside. So that means that both of them complete each other. And a man is known to be one that will complement his wife. And, and that is how Allah has created the man. And likewise, the woman is meant to complement the woman. If, uh, uh, sorry, the man. And if we can stop looking at it as the battle of the sexes and, and, and look at it as the unification of sexes, inshallah, we will be a successful nation. Jazakum Allah both for your time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Until next week, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. واحتفل بالمودة ملاحن ناسا حبك بيض الله قلبك بيض الله قلبك جميل المساعي وملاحن ناسا حبك